Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Neve McCarthy. I am a senior ESG analyst at Climate Advisors and a part of Chain Reaction Research. So today we are joined by Chris Wiggs from Aid Environment and Harard Rake from Profundo, both members of the Chain Reaction Research Consortium. Here with us today, we also have Eleanor Spencer and Clara Mello from the SPOT Initiative at the Zoological Society of London as well as Mark Kenber from Orbitas Finance. Our panelists will discuss how financiers can analyze a broad range of risks associated with companies that operate in Indonesian palm oil, as well as their downstream supply chain impacts. So let's start now with a brief overview of today's webinar. We'll be covering a variety of different resources and methodologies for analyzing risks in the Indonesian palm oil sector. So first, Eleanor will start with a presentation on the role of transparency and data. Then Chris will walk us through deforestation monitoring, followed by Harard, who will cover the financial risks in company supply chains. And finally, Mark will discuss the recent findings of Orbitas Finance research into stranded assets risks related to climate transitions. You can see our lineup of speakers here and note that all attendee microphones will be muted during the webinar. Please do remember to submit questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A option in your Zoom control panel. Finally, a recording of this webinar will be made available by email to all registrants within the next few days. So with that, let's pass it on to Eleanor to talk about transparency in the palm oil sector. Great, thank you. Um, hi, so, yeah, so my name is Eleanor. I work for the Zoological Society of London, ZSL. It's an international conservation charity. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm just going to give a kind of brief overview on the importance of transparency and disclosure in the Indonesian palm oil sector and uh, a bit of an introduction to what we do through SPOT. Um, so as everyone here is obviously aware, the production of soft commodities in tropical regions has long been associated with various environmental and social issues. Deforestation and the degradation of tropical forests is a particularly vital one to look at. And uh, one that underpins a lot of the other issues, um, whether you're talking about climate change or fires and haze, uh, looking at biodiversity loss or the loss of local community access to their lands and to ecosystem services. So deforestation is quite a useful uh, lens to come into this from. Um, and although 2020 was meant to be the kind of big year of success and change on deforestation, unfortunately, we've, we've clearly seen that's not happened. A lot of the 2020 commitments that were set um, have not been met and forest loss has been accelerating globally in, in recent years, with last year one of the worst years on record um, this century for tropical forest loss. Uh, next slide please. So just to give a little context uh, to that, this is data from uh, the University of Maryland and, and WRI and as we can see the uh, last year was the third highest tropical forest uh, loss rate in, in primary tropical forest sorry since 2002 and all of the highest years have been within the last five years um, and in Indonesia we can see that there has been a kind of opposite trend in recent years that the that forest loss uh, has been decreasing consistently for the last four years and this is absolutely something that we need to celebrate and to recognize um, but at the same time, we can't get too complacent. Uh, it's still the fourth, has the fourth highest um, rate of primary tropical forest loss in the world. We still lost around a quarter of a million hectares just of primary uh, tropical forest in Indonesia last year. And uh, there are various kind of uh, trends and, and upcoming potential issues that we need to keep an eye on, um, which may mean that we see this rate start to creep up again. Um, for instance, the high CPO prices at the moment uh, the introduction of the omnibus law last year, uh, the food estate program in Indonesia and the, and the drive for biofuels, I think are all factors that we need to be uh, carefully considering when we're looking at these trends. Next slide, please. Uh, so to just to understand these trends a bit more and how key stakeholders can engage with the industries behind them, it's important to look at what companies in specific sectors are committed to and to what they report to be doing. Uh, and this kind of transparency is, is a key first step towards sustainability. And arguably, we shouldn't still be on first steps after several decades 
of deforestation and, and other issues. Um, but unfortunately, from the data, we see that in a lot of cases, we still are at that first step. Um, this infographic is just looking at some of our palm oil assessment results from last year, which I'll explain in a bit more detail in a second. Um, but it's really just a focus on the fact that NDP has been pushed for the last uh, decade or so as one of the kind of key uh, commitments that companies in the palm oil sector need to make to zero deforestation and other elements of NDPE. And yet from our results last year, looking at 100 companies, we see that although the majority have strong uh, zero deforestation commitments now in place, there's still around 30% of them that don't. And, uh, and less than half of them are reporting clear actions on how they're monitoring deforestation, which is uh, kind of a basic measure of, of looking at how they implement these commitments. So just to make the point really that um, in a lot of cases, we still are at that first step on, on just transparency. Um, next slide, please. I won't dwell on this, but just um, to make the point that obviously we're not just talking about zero deforestation here, it's one of many issues. Um, but across all the different environmental, social and governance issues that we look at through SPOT, we see the same trend that on average, uh, most companies are not being transparent on these issues yet. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just give a little bit of context to SPOT and what we do. The SPOT is a project of ZSL, of our business and biodiversity team. Uh, and it's a free online platform launched in 2014 to look at the uh, the quality and the transparency of company disclosure in key tropical forest risk commodity sectors uh, on, on key ESG issues. So we look at palm oil, timber and pulp and rubber. Uh, on the palm oil side, we cover 100 companies that are upstream in the supply chain, so producers, processors and traders. And we provide um, information on our assessment of their public um, disclosure on key issues to help key stakeholders such as their investors, their lenders, uh, their downstream buyers and other NGOs uh, to leverage this data to, to really um, improve their engagement with those companies and uh, to hold them to account on their commitments, but also to support them to push for better practice on the ground as well. Uh, next slide, please. So I won't go into too much detail, but on the Palmol side, we cover 180 different indicators across 10 categories of ESG. Uh, and as I said, we're, this is the focus here is on transparency. So we're looking at what companies report publicly on their websites and their reports, etc. And we're looking not just at the kind of presence, absence of policies, but also the really kind of digging into the details of those policies. How robust are they? What's the scope of them? Do they have time bound elements? Uh, as well as what companies then report against those policies? What do they report they're doing to implement them? Um, and, and just the note, obviously, this is one tool and as I say, a first step to start an engagement process with a company and to identify key ways, uh, key areas to talk to a company and to push them for uh, improvement. But it's not an assessment of what a company does on the ground and so should be combined with other, other data sources to look at that element. Uh, next slide, please. Mm. I won't dwell on this here either, but uh, just to point out that we also engage with the companies themselves through the assessment process. So that's another way that we um, are able to, to support companies to improve their transparency and, and action on the ground. Next slide, please. So I'll now just um, focus in a little bit on our results from last year, looking at uh, palm oil in Indonesia, which is the focus of today. Uh, and I think it's important when we're talking about Indonesian palm oil companies to be clear what we mean by that. Um, here we've just split the data from our assessments last year into two. So the, the, on the left is companies that are headquartered in Indonesia, whereas on the right is companies that operate in Indonesia but are headquartered elsewhere. And it's interesting once you make this split, you can see there is really quite a significant difference that we're seeing in the results um, on average between those two groups, with companies that are headquartered in Indonesia generally a lot less transparent than the average, uh, whereas those that operate in Indonesia are headquartered elsewhere, generally um, more transparent than the average across all those categories. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I'll, I'll just sit through these a little bit just to show you can see the same split across different indicator types and um, across different 
um, categories. Next slide, please. And also when we dig into individual indicators, which is important, of course, when looking at a specific company and the potential risks that it, um, that it has and, and that you need to engage with it on as a key stakeholder, whether it's an investor or a lender, et cetera. Um, so looking at responsibility for sustainability high up within the organization. Again, we see that companies um, that are headquartered in Indonesia are performing less well there. Next slide, please. Uh, we see the same when we look at certification, whether it's membership or percent of certification. Next slide, please. And again, on climate change, although generally all companies that we looked at don't, aren't particularly transparent on climate change. Uh, I think since this is coming up in, in other talks in a minute, it's important to note particularly that um, no companies that are headquartered in Indonesia have a strong power commitment of any kind on a time-bound commitment to reduce greenhouse gases and, uh, and only one of them had some form of assessment of the risks of climate change to its own um, business in a financial sense. Next slide, please. So um, just to think about the, obviously we can't say definitively why we're seeing these trends, but it is interesting to think about some of the potential factors. Um, for companies that are headquartered in Indonesia, we generally see a higher proportion of private companies, which are of course harder to influence. Of the public companies that we um, assess, they're generally much smaller than those that are headquartered elsewhere. They perhaps have less capacity to engage on sustainability and, and to improve their transparency. Uh, and they also generally engage with us less, which obviously means, you know, has an effect potentially on their um, ability to improve their score, but also is perhaps an indicator of, a, of reduced engagement in general on sustainability with NGOs and, and with others more broadly. So uh, next slide, please. I'll just, to kind of wrap up on that, um, I think it is important to note that although, as I've shown, um, we're generally seeing national Indonesian companies are less transparent than the average. We are also seeing a significant um, improvement in their scores quite rapidly at the moment. About a quarter of them last year improved their, their score a lot on spot and, um, and one of the biggest increases that we saw was an Indonesian company. But in general we're seeing that the palm oil sector is becoming slowly more transparent but it really is um, too slow. We're at about 42 percent on average across these hundred companies and it's 2021 so it's it's really too late and we really encourage um, investors, lenders, buyers, other key stakeholders to look at companies both on this um, broader kind of comparison across an industry and across a country and to, to kind of dig into the different ways to split that data but also to look at the detail at an individual company level and to pursue a strong engagement with um, any companies that invest in or, or buy from um, in order to push them to improve their practices on the ground and to hold them accountable to the uh, commitments that they do make through their policies. And I will stop there because I'm aware I'm going over time. Thank you. Great, we'll hand it over to Chris now from Aid Environment. Hi, thank you Neve. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm, I work for Aid Environment and with Profundo and Climate Advisors we are part of the Chain Reaction Research Consortium. Um, I'm just going to talk um, briefly about practically how we do the sustainability analysis of companies and then I'll pass over to Harad, my colleague, who will talk about the financial analysis. So um, Aid Environment has been working in um, Southeast Asia for over 10 years and really our focus has been on stopping deforestation. And we always believed that the best way to do that was to have the most thorough understanding of uh, the landscape in Southeast Asia as possible. So along with our partner organization, Earth Equalizer, we um, focused on trying to work out um, where the concessions were, who operates them, which corporate groups those um, concessions belong to, and then sort of monitoring those concessions to determine where the deforestation was taking place. And in um, the last 10 years, we've am amassed a concession database that covers almost 20 million hectares in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Papua New Guinea. Um, we've then um, worked out who owns those um, concessions and we map and monitor 526 corporate groups. So in practice, what that means is we can, um, using various monitoring tools, can work out where the deforestation is taking place. We overlay that with our concession database and we know whether deforestation is within side concessions or outside of concessions. 
And then from that information, um, yeah, we have a pretty good understanding of uh, who is responsible for the deforestation. Uh, next slide. So then it's not just knowing whether it's inside or outside of a concession, you have to know who's responsible and who owns it. Um, ownership data in Indonesia, Malaysia and Papua New Guinea is publicly available, so it's relatively easy to work out who is the biggest shareholder of a plantation company. It's then doing a lot of corporate research to work out um, the sort of um, business relationships, family, personal relationships between companies, so you can work out sort of where the ultimate beneficial owner is and the sort of power structures of these um, concession companies. And this um, table chart that you can see shows um, the ownership structure of a Malaysian company. So we detected deforestation on a concession in Malaysia. And then by putting all our information together and analyzing who is the sort of power player behind this deforestation, you can sort of put the corporate ownership structure together and work out how you can um, influence this business uh, and stop the deforestation. Um, one of the most effective ways since the implementation of no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation policies has been using this supply chain approach. Um, and the way to link it to um, international supply chains is via public supply list or trade data. So you can see where the, um, the plantation is, and the mill is selling to um, and link it to these companies with NDP policies. Next slide. So you can do all sorts of analysis on this data. You can work out um, who the largest deforesters um, in the region are, and that's what we did with this slide. This um, shows data from 2020, so the biggest um, deforesters, uh, the green figures, and then linking it to international supply chains, and you can see some of the companies implicated on the right. Uh, next slide. Um, you can then, as well as identifying sort of companies that are active in deforestation, you can um, run analysis on particular markets, um, particular geographies. So um, last year we analyzed the refining capacity in Indonesia and Malaysia to work out how much of it was covered by NDP policies and found that 83% was, um, that reduces to 78% when assessed against certain KPIs. You can um, determine who the biggest leakage refiners are, and you can um, analyze specific uh, geographies like South Korea, Japan, China. And that deforestation data all just comes from having a really in-depth knowledge of um, land use in Indonesia and who's responsible. And that's sort of where it all comes from. Uh, next slide. You can also do sort of a slightly different um, analysis. This is uh, a map from the Stranded Land paper that we wrote um, a couple of years ago, which um, showed that there was 6.4 million hectares of forest and peatland remaining with inside concessions. Um, and you can then analyze changes and decreases or increases in stranded land or HCV areas, HCS areas. Um, and from that, you can help inform sort of government policies, um, some of uh, industry commitments to recovery, um, and that's sort of what Chain Reaction research is, research is, is sustainability research is based on. It's, it's sort of that kind of analysis. I'm happy to answer questions uh, about this uh, at the end, and I will now pass over to my colleague Harad to talk about the financial analysis. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, well, we had, uh, uh, as part of, uh, of uh, Chain Reaction research, we built on the knowledge uh, at Profundo we built it on the knowledge of uh, aid environment, in particular the, uh, the supply chain uh, transparency, which we try to give to investors. And um, within the sheets that I, uh, with the sheets that I will present, I would like to focus on three important points. That is the, uh, the various types of, uh, of, uh, of financial risks in the supply chain. Uh, um, secondly, I'd like to talk about the uh, the, the, a profit chain analysis, who is earning the money in this supply chain, uh, probably also then uh, uh, facing the highest risk. And I like, in that context, I also like to talk, okay, who can, um, uh, who can pay for, uh, for a better execution of an NDPE policy in the supply chain of, of palm oil. Well, if we look to, uh, to this sheet, um, this, uh, this is a list of, of, of the various uh, financial risks that are uh, relevant for finances. Uh, 
in case of deforestation. Um, there is stranded asset risk. Uh, that is in particular very important for the upstream companies, for the plantations. Um, we can make a calculation of that as a percentage of the, of the enterprise value. We have market access risk. If plantations are uh, excluded from supply chains, from traders because of deforestation, they can lose sales and they can uh, lose uh, uh, earnings, EBITDA. Uh, also, that uh, value you can calculate. There's regulation risk. Um, that happens uh, in all levels of the supply chain. Policy implementation costs, I will come back on that later in the context of who is earning the money in the supply chain of, uh, of palm oil. Um, then we have financing risk. Yes, there is a risk, increasing risk that investors, they need to be more open on their, on, 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 on their supply chain. Companies need to be more transparent on the supply chain. Investors, there is in the European Union, there is a uh, sustainable finance uh, uh, directive regulation. So there must be much more transparency on supply chain. Probably some investors will not be able to finance certain parts of the chain anymore and that can impact the cost of capital. Of course, with a market access risk leading to lower EBITDA, there's also an impact on the net debt EBITDA of a company, and that also can further increase the financing risks. Uh, this can happen in, all in, in the whole chain. Um, next slide, please. Particularly very important for, uh, for, for, for fast moving consumer co good companies. They are not so much confronted with standard asset risk. They don't have uh, plantations anymore. Uh, they are also, market access risk is also, let's say, a little bit mitigated for these. These companies, that's why we have looked at the reputation risk. And that's quite a new field. Uh, and we have done uh, some research on that. We have we had a report out on this two years ago, and that's mainly in the whole context of the 2020 zero deforestation deadline. And increasingly, investors are looking to this, uh, looking to reputation, also, of course, in relation to the regulation for investors I just mentioned, for, for, for instance, for, for investors in the European, in the European Union. And this, this, this table is quite interesting. It shows you that, uh, uh, that, uh, this, that this is a big sample of companies which, have, which, which has been confronted with reputation risk. There are companies which are handling reputation issues quite positive. They are, let's say, winners. They are, uh, not, not, they are proactive, not reactive. Uh, but there are also companies which neglect it, they deny it, uh, they are reactive. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how the impacts are, uh, are increasing over time. In 2000, such a group would have been impacted by minus 17% if you had a very bad, uh, bad press. Uh, but in 2018, it has increased to minus 29%. Uh, so Probably that is due to social, to, to social media. For the winners, exactly the same. And it's interesting to see how there's a big difference between companies which do really bad in reputation, companies which do good in reputation. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite important to be invested in the right company, as you can see, if you get minus 29% or plus 20, 20%. Um, next slide, please. Um, I can now go to the second point, who is making the profit in the chain? Well, this table sh shows an example of a commodity, which is, uh, we have done this analysis for another commodity than palm oil. Currently, we are executing the same research on palm, palm oil, but it, it, this commodity is a little bit the same as same characteristics as, uh, as palm oil. And what's very interesting, uh, in the in the in the left uh, in the in the column right, you can see the, um, the, the 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 escalation of the price of 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 this commodity. Uh, when it is coming from plantations, it's cheap, but gradually in the chain, the embedded product gets more and more expensive, and that's also impacting, of course, the profitability. 
uh, who is earning the money on this embedded uh, palm oil? Well, this commodity X, you can see that the fast moving consumer good companies, that they are really earning most of the value in, in the chain. Supermarkets are also still earning a lot in the chain. Uh, while the millers, they, uh, we, we just talked a lot about, about plantations, but they are earning much less in the chain. Uh, and that's probably also how, it, how finances are also uh, uh, engaged in the various levels uh, of the chain. And uh, um, we go to the next slide. This is an example uh, of the plantation level in the chain, how the, these this is a group of four companies which have uh, been confronted with supply chain suspensions by uh, buyers. These plantations had uh, uh, had, uh, had deforestation in the chain and the non-NDP uh, leakage market is shrinking. And this is the impact that you get more suspensions. And the, the financial impact on this level for these companies individually it can be quite large. So next slide, please. Uh, the material impact for these four companies, it was SSMS, in, Indofood Agri, ANJ, and uh, Tunis Baro Lampo. Uh, we've looked to, this, to, 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 to the various uh, elements and there was quite some reductions in revenues, cross profit, EBITDA. Uh, also the balance sheets were, were, because of the suspensions were affected they got higher receivables, higher inventories, so the net debt levels moved up strongly, uh, and they faced an, an, a decline in their equity, val equity value. And if you look to the total equity value lost for this group of four companies, it was 1.1 billion US dollars, and they lost around more than 100 million dollars of, uh, of net profit in this whole period. And that are substantial numbers for these individual uh, companies. However, within the supply chain, it can be much worse for some companies and for some investors. Next slide, please. This is for the downstream companies. And uh, the companies themselves, they, and that's in the red lines, they, uh, and that is from CDP, uh, the sources from uh, carbon disclosure uh, projects. And the companies themselves think that they don't run a big reputation risk or a big market risk. Uh, that are the, the, so the red lines are quite quite low. As you can see, Unilever thinks that if they do wrong in their palm oil supply chain, they can only lose 182 million US dollars. But in our methodology of reputation risk, these numbers can, can be much and much higher. And as you can see, for uh, Unilever, it can be 42 billion. Uh, overall, this, 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 this reputation risk for fast moving consumer good companies, this is a, uh, for, for a group of top 25 companies, and this is a group of eight, com eight to nine companies out of the top 25 sources from, from palm oil. Uh, those reputation risk values were 16 to 167 times larger than for the four upstream case studies that, that I just showed, including SSMS and Indofood uh, food Agri. So this is something uh, that still needs to develop with more social media attention, with more uh, pressure from regulation from, from, from the European Union. This, will, uh, this is the future. This is already happening. Uh, next slide, please. And that's also to, to put it into context because the companies, they could really take action and investors could engage with the various levels in the chain to, uh, to discuss how to get um, uh, zero deforestation supply chains in, in palm oil. This is an example for Procter & Gamble. Uh, the company is sourcing around half a million uh, tons of palm oil. And that has a value uh, if it's only palm oil, but they often also buy more expensive derivatives of 270, 80 million. Uh, if they would a uh, best in class uh, uh, palm oil execu uh, NDPE execution, monitoring, verification, they would spend 65 US dollars per ton. That's in total for, for, what, they, for, the, for the, what they source, it's 30 million 
of US dollars, 30 million. If you look to the palm oil related product sales in this company, that's 20 to 40% of their total business, they are earning their gross profit of 10 billion. 10 billion. Uh, they are, um, and if you then compare this number of 30 million of a better execution certification in the palm oil, uh, in, 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 in the palm oil sourcing and the, the derivatives of palm oil, then this 30 million is only 0.12% of the retail value of a product. Uh, 0.12%. It would mean that a bottle of, uh, of head and shoulders would move up from three US dollars to, yes, only three US dollars. So there's not, not any big change. And that's with such a low amount of money, they can much better improve the transparency, the execution, monitoring, and verification of the whole supply chain. So that's also why there's a lot of responsibility at the fast moving consumer good companies. And for investors, it would be a very, uh, a very good win win uh, engagement opportunity to this kind of companies. So I'd like to turn the next slide to Mark. Thank you, Hiran. And thank you to all the, all the previous speakers. And I hope, I think that what I'm about to say is uh, will build on that. I think one starting point is, as Eleanor said, uh, while many of the companies are improving in many aspects of what they're doing, uh, there is little assessment and next to no action on climate change. And uh, Orbitas specifically looks at that and uh, one aspect of the risks that Herard mentioned, which was uh, stranded asset risks associated with climate uh, transitions. So, as I say, or Orbitas is looking, looks specifically at the risks and importantly the opportunities that uh, tropical commodity producers and specifically their finances and investors face from climate transitions. So climate transitions understood as the responses by governments through policy, through corporates such as the fast moving consumer goods companies that uh, Herard was talking about in their corporate commitments, but also through changes in consumer preferences and consumer demand and those together uh, under a range of different scenarios impact on the whole of tropical commodity value chains and we look specifically um, at the upstream end of that. Why? Well I mean just I think repeat things that you all probably know already. Agricultural land use and forestry are responsible for at least a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions but also represent the sectors where there are good opportunities to reduce emissions and conserve uh, carbon in the short term, as that's to say over the next 10 years. Tropical deforestation, as Elena said at the beginning, is continuing at a high level, albeit having decreased in Indonesia. And it is almost axiomatic to say now that the world is responding to climate change. We can see that while it's not happening quickly enough, more and more companies are setting themselves on, countries are setting themselves on paths to net zero emissions by uh, mid-century. We're seeing I think it's over four or 500 companies that now have commitments uh, consistent with a net zero world by uh, mid-century. And we're seeing changes in consumer behavior. We, I saw a survey, which I'm not sure if I completely believe, that suggests that the number of vegans in Britain has tripled in the last five years. And we're seeing uh, similar evidence elsewhere. So whether you like it or not, there are going to be changes and transitions, and they are going to affect every single sector of the economy. We've already seen in some sectors that this is becoming reasonably well understood. The work that Carbon Tracker, for example, have done around the carbon bubble, showing what, what uh, climate transitions mean for the reserves and hence the market value and profitability of oil and gas companies. And as a consequence, uh, some divestment and a lot of pressure on oil and gas companies to rethink their future, future strategies. But these risks are not yet understood or taken into account in the in the land economy and particularly in the tropical agricultural sector we for example con, uh, contracted pwc to do a bit of sur a survey with for us last year of 26 in uh, financial institutions that had direct and material exposure to tropical commodity production uh, not one of them is currently screening for transition risks in the sector and nor do they have the tools with which to do so and as a result they are continuing to finance 
producers and invest in producers and the value chains that are predicated on increasing expansion of land, increasing deforestation and increasing exploitation of peatlands. Not only is that bad for the environment and obviously for the climate, it also makes for bad decision making by the financiers and investors themselves. They are investing suboptimally while at the same time generating damage to our environment. Next slide, please. So what Orbitas has done is con combined a series of existing models and created an analytical framework that allows us to take a range of scenarios at the global and local level, scenarios around how climate responses would evolve over time. And I'm, I'll show you the example from Indonesia in a moment, but we looked at scenarios that ranged from a four degree world in the future, basically where nobody does anything more than they are at the moment, through to a 1.5 prosperous, 1.5 degree prosperous world where there's coordinated action, investment in R&D and technology and so on and so forth, and three or um, three scenarios in between. So based on those scenarios, we can, we've done analysis of uh, across a range of different sectors globally, what does this mean for input prices, output prices, land prices, um, market share and so on, and land use. And then we can look at that, at what does it mean for specific land use and land, land costs versus optimal land use uh, in a range of countries. Take that, look at the industry level, so the sector as a whole, what does this mean for uh, profitability, output, inputs, costs and so on within industries and then look at specific companies and assets to look at how exposed they are to transition risks and how capable they are of responding to them, but at the same time how capable they are of responding to the fairly substantial opportunities that also exist uh, in the context of climate transitions. Next slide, please. So we, as I mentioned, we created six scenarios at a global level. And then in the context of Indonesia, which these scenarios uh, refer to, worked with uh, a range of stakeholders and experts within Indonesia to create three uh, global local scenarios that are applicable to Indonesia. Uh, historical ambition, which is consistent with the four degrees world, modest ambition hopefully gets us to around three degrees, and aggressive ambition would hopefully get us to 1.5 degrees. And we've got a, a range of carbon prices, and those should be understood as, stood as both potentially carbon tax or equivalent on, for example, fu uh, fossil fuels, but also an opportunity cost in that they represent a price that would be available for forest conservation, car conservation of carbon in forests or reforestation. So it's both a real cost and potentially an opportunity cost. Um, direct restrictions on access to forested land and protected areas. And you can see in the aggressive ambition scenario, uh, protected land is significantly greater than it is at cur currently. Uh, specific Indonesian land use restrictions on conversion and whether they apply to uh, only large scale producers or also to smallholders. And that, I think, as all the panelists and all those on the, on the uh, webinar will recognize, there are uh, getting on for a million smallholder palm, palm producers in Indonesia. And as in many countries, smallholder farmers tend to be ignored by or excused from policy, but whether they are or not makes a huge difference on the outcome. And then as a final variable is uh, bio demand for bioenergy. Next slide, please. So we take this, those, th those three scenarios and look at them within the context of uh, a range of different types of Indonesian palm oil companies from large agribusinesses that have uh, complete value chains uh, through to individual plantation owners or millers or refiners or traders. And you can sort of uh, break the, use, using a sort of SWOT table, break down the uh, sort of risks and opportunities that companies are facing. So we found, and I'll go into a little bit more detail of this in a moment, on the opportunity side, there is hardly any uh, biogas uh, captures and mainly methane capture and use in cogeneration. Uh, perhaps uh, two to three percent of the potential is currently being taken up. And yet in the context of rising carbon prices and therefore rising costs of diesel for gen sets and rising costs of electricity, there is huge potential not only to generate more electricity for use on site, but also to supply local uh, electricity networks and repl replace uh, some of the diesel gen sets that are used. There are also, and this is not unique, but is special to the case of palm 
there are unlikely to be substitutes anytime soon. And given that, as we've seen, palm oil, you know, as Gerard mentioned, palm oil in one way or another is in 40, 40 plus percent of the products that product, uh, Procter & Gamble produce, as population increases, as income increases, so demand for palm oil and palm oil derivatives is likely to increase as well. So there is the potential to take advantage of rising palm oil prices by improving yields sustainably, but only those companies that are able to do that, to meet NDPE restrictions and improve their yields sustainably, will be able to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, if they don't, then they will be exposed to many of the threats, such as high and rising emissions costs for fertilizer, transport, processing, uh, refrigeration, and so on and so forth, higher land prices, and other speakers have already mentioned increasing reputational risk from being associated with deforestation. So I think this is, a, I won't go into more detail on this slide, but there are both significant opportunities, but also very significant threats to those who are not able to monitor, assess the risks associated with climate transitions and take action accordingly. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna race through this a little bit as I know uh, we haven't got an awful lot of time left, but some of the results that we found are that in, an in the aggressive scenario, so where there's genuine action to confront climate change on, and put us on a 1.5 degree path, uh, palm oil prices increased by up to 30%. And that's because there is less land available, there's greater demand, and therefore, uh, all things being equal, prices will increase. But land values are also 50% higher, and we look globally, if you want to get on a 1.5 degree world, about 10% of current agricultural land needs to revert to natural, generation, natural vegetation or be reforested. So that pushes up the price of land available for agriculture. As a result, Palm yields have to be higher if you're going to meet that demand with those prices. And at the same time, companies face very, very significant potential emissions costs. And you can see that in the chart on the right hand side. However, those who do take advantage of this by acting sustainably and, and taking advantage of the opportunities can gain close to 10 billion additional net present value of their assets in relation in comparison to the historical scenario. Next slide, please. Um, and so the, that, as I say, there's this 9 billion uh, opportunity, but to take advantage of that, one has to, the companies have to invest in sustainable yield improvements, not only on their own plantations, but also on those of their suppliers, many of whom will be smallholders. They have to take advantage of the non-palm oil opportunities, as I mentioned, biogas capture and co-generation, and continue to be investing in R&D. And that, from the final slide, please, um, suggests that, and here is a sample of the companies in Indonesia that we looked at, that those companies that have a low cost of capital, low WAC, but also have high yields are well placed to take advantage of the climate transition opportunities. So they tend to be well managed, efficient, and have good access to cheap capital. So those companies that are at the top right hand corner of this graph, whereas those closer to the origin, are those who have low yields, inefficiently managed, and have high costs of capital. And those are the ones that are most likely to be vulnerable to climate transition risks. However, as I said at the moment, at the beginning, finance, financiers and capital, other capital providers are not yet taking this into account. So probably do not look at these companies in the way, or look at their vulnerability to climate transition risk as they do their calculations and assessments of risk and return. Thank you. Great, thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists for such insightful presentations. Um, it was great to see the analysis from all of these different perspectives and I'm sure uh, our audience thought so as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you guys in the question and answer session. Uh, remember to all of the attendees that the Q&A is open and feel free to submit your questions uh, in your Zoom control panel. So we already have a few questions that came in. The first one is how does the materiality of risk compare with the materiality of the sustainability investment? Uh, and this is a question for both Harard and, and Mark. So maybe we'll start with you, Harard. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, the, um, uh, the investments in, um, in, in, in a better sustainability in palm oil, and then, uh, well, we, we, we translate it into 
um, uh, a better NDPE policy execution, uh, monitoring, verification. Uh, those uh, we have looked at that from what what does it cost for a fast-moving consumer good company? Well, that's uh, and that's also the example of Procter and Gamble that we had. The uh, the costs of this uh, of this uh, improved policy on the palm oil supply chain is really dwarfed by uh, the the reputation risk that a fast moving consumer good company is experiencing, and that is and really that is that is that is ten folds of the um, investments that the company should do, and that's why it's such an enormous win win opportunity for fast-moving consumer good companies. The fast-moving consumer good companies can, with a good behavior, they can gain a lot in the share price, in lower financing costs, in a higher EBITDA, uh, while the investments in a better execution are very non-material. So that's a, a very clear win-win. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Mark, do you have anything to add? Yeah, th thanks, Neve, and thanks, Gerard. Um, I think that there's a big difference between the fast moving consumer goods and the upstream suppliers, as, as you yourself mentioned in your presentation. The risks to the upstream producer, plantation owners and producers are, are significant, uh, up to 19 billion uh, in lost value. Um, the opportunities are also material, but the investment costs are much higher than, it are, than is the case for the fast moving consumer goods company. And that requires therefore not just a reliance on private sector finance particularly in the case of smallholder farmers who many of whom don't have access to con traditional conventional uh, capital markets it will it will be the people who the companies that buy from them who will need to finance them but also uh, public sector investment in r d um, accelerated replanting with the necessary insurance and uh, support in place for smallholders obviously cannot say well I'm not going to produce for three years while I replant so it's going to require a sort of cross-sectoral effort will require significant investment but it's an investment which you know as, as Gerard, Gerard says the fast moving consumer com good companies because of the reputational risk are going to demand sustainable inputs and therefore it's not going to be just a question of do you make more or less profit you will see your access to market severely constrained if not curtailed altogether if you are not producing in a way that meets the supply requirements of those uh, consumer good companies great thank you mark uh, so we have a couple of questions here on the rspo so i'll combine them here for eleanor uh, on transparency so how does the rspo address transparency do you have any ideas for improvement and in general, what other ideas do you have for increasing both data availability and transparency in the sector? Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so we do, through the spot assessments, we do look at RSPO certification. It's quite a big component of what we're looking at on companies' public reporting. Um, and so certainly through the um, audit reports, that come through from RSPO certification. There's a lot of information that's, uh, that is out there in the public domain. We try and make some of that more um, accessible through bringing it through the assessments. But in that sense, I mean, it, yes, it's supporting transparency because those, if those assessments are made publicly available. Um, but that's one of the things that we look at is, is whether companies are, are making such information permanently publicly available and not just within the, the time periods required as part of the RSPO process. Um, so, so it's a mix, I think, um, it makes the information, the information's there, but it's up to companies to make sure that it remains accessible. Um, in terms of uh, improvements, uh, generally sort of, I think was the question for the RSPO or for the sector generally? Uh, both. In, do you see improvements uh, that the RSPO could make in terms of increasing transparency, but do you also see in general in the sector any other opportunities? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously, um, I, I think I partly is answered by the first part. I think it is up to companies to make the information publicly available. There is a lot that comes through the process of RSPO certification, but it is, uh, companies do need to make that choice. Uh, there's also obviously in some cases restrictions that are beyond companies' um, control necessarily that come perhaps from a national or local government level. 
Um, so it's not all necessarily kind of owned by one actor. Um, and I think in terms of kind of strengthening the RSPO, since we're talking here about engagement with the financial sector, I think it's important to note that uh, financial sector actors need to push much more and to um, be more involved in processes like the RSPO to, to have their voice heard and to, to push for improvements and represent that sector in that space. Thank I can you, maybe Greg. add to the RSPO discussion, if that's okay. Great, thank you. Um, it has been really difficult with the RSPO for them to deal with some of the big issues in the sector, particularly around transparency. They have, to their credit, tried. They've expanded their membership rules um, to try to address the fact that the ownership structure of companies is often very complex. Um, but it hasn't really been sufficient, and that's not necessarily the RSPO's fault. Like one of the issues we see in the sector is that um, sort of companies will use secrecy jurisdictions to hide uh, ownership of, of companies. So as a organization, NGOs, researchers find it incredibly difficult to prove ownership of companies and to expect the RSPO then to also find a way to deal with that is, you know, it's maybe too much of an ask. Um, but some of these issues are being addressed um, in the complaint system. So you will see, if you look at the case tracker of the RSPO website, you will see that NGOs or CSOs have specifically complained about um, companies or lack of transparency, um, claiming that there's ownership overlap when there's really no evidence, but um, there's indications. And the RSPO complaints panel are trying to find a way to deal with that. Usually it's by requesting ownership documents and then often there's like a stalemate because the company refuses to do that in the complaint system and then the complaint system operates under um, ethos of transparency so the complaint just sort of sits there. Um, so if you look into some of the streams in the RSPO, the complaints, the compensation, um, the grievance mechanisms, you will sometimes see these issues being addressed but the RSPO has its systems and I hope that some of these can be addressed by the complaint system and then if you sort of have a breakthrough then it, it often happens with the RSPO that they it follows that that will result in um, the secretariat changing rules um, via its own processes but there are mechanisms for um, I'm sure attendees here today to uh, submit resolutions with the RSPO submit um, complaints and the RSPO really does um, depend on stakeholders engaging with the, the sort of systems they have in place. So, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Uh, our next question is, what do you think the best way is to ensure a global demand for sustainable cargo and not only putting pressure uh, from the European Union and countries like New Zealand? So this one, I think, uh, let's start with Chris. Uh, and then whoever else would like to can jump in. Sorry. Um, so what's what's the best way to encourage demand for sustainable products? Um, gosh, I, I don't know, really. It's incredibly difficult um, because I think that has been one of the problems is that it, the demand often comes from NGOs and isn't always um, in line with consumer demands or what consumers are willing to pay. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why the NDP policies have been, so there was, there's been another question on our the Q and A about legality. And I, my response to that would be that everything in the sector that we have worked on has been looking at NDP policies because they often, they cover the whole industry and, and almost remove themselves from legality because um, they're cross-cultural, cross-jurisdictional. Um, but what has been so successful about them is that they have tried to apply a policy, um, an industry-wide policy from which we can assess um, sustainability, by which, from which we can work, work through like stopping deforestation. So using the sort of industry-wide um, peat moratorium to, um, to stop peat clearance and to, to have a sort of argument um, through which we can engage companies that are deforesting peat um, or with HCS, you know, it's not perfect, but it's a mechanism. And I sometimes feel like um, it really is a sort of industry policy that we have to work on because it sort of doesn't, doesn't matter then if there's fluctuations in demand or if there are different demands by companies, at least as we have one consistent policy that we can all sort of work towards. And that's why we sort of 
look into some of these leakage markets where the consumer demand might be low, but because you have a consistent policy um, and you can sort of make the argument that this policy has had a positive impact in other areas, um, that tends to help. Um, yeah, I don't know if other, other people here have a different opinion. I mean, let me jump in. I, I think you're absolutely right, Chris, but there's another kind of angle to this. And I think part of the question that was in the Q&A box was, you know, at the moment you have the EU and perhaps New Zealand and a few others putting pressure on, but a large part of the demand comes from countries that are not uh, exercising particular caution or in showing particular interest in uh, reducing deforestation, at least in tropical commodity supply chains. We have some a series of big conferences and events this year we have the cop 26 on the climate change in glasgow we've got the biodiversity cop g20 and g7 meetings those seem to me to be absolutely the right places where this sort of coordinated action to avoid you know one part of the world saying we only want sustainable palm oil but then the unsustainable palm oil going somewhere else it has to be coordinated in some way internationally and it's going to involve both governments and the the end use uh well, the users represented by the fast-moving consumer goods companies uh, will have to be involved. And, and to a certain extent, that seems to be, and I'm not kind of fully cognizant of what's going on, but seems to be happening through the work of the Tropical Forest Alliance and the multi-sector, multi-country dialogue that the UK government and TFA are leading and a no number of other initiatives. But um, I think, you know, what's implied in the question is that we won't succeed on this until all the major buying countries and companies are involved. And it's going to be multilateral frameworks where these things have to be worked out. Thank you so much. And I think that that really leads us in well to uh, our next question, which unfortunately I think might be our last given our time constraints. Um, so Mark, you've also talked a lot about climate transitions related to government action in general and your Orbitas research as well. In an ideal world, what would you see as some good actions that the Indonesian government could take to encourage sustainability in the sector? Well, I think that the first point is to recognize that while climate transitions do bring risks, they also bring opportunities. And so the initial response should not be, this looks scary, therefore we're going to do nothing or block change. Rather, the change is inevitable. Um, and therefore, how does a country respond best to those transitions? And it's by looking at the opportunity side and what do, what do the governments in terms of regulation, but also in terms of support, and as I mentioned briefly, you know, support for R&D, uh, getting uh, where it's a country that receives ODA, making sure that ODA is linked to improving the sustainable yield improvements of smallholder farmers, um, extension services, education outreach, but also uh, ensuring that the financial sector, whether it's kind of lenders or investors, are taking into account the risks and opportunities and using them uh, in their risk return calculations and their decisions about lending and, and investing. So it's going to require something from all the sectors and governments have a unique role through their uh, position as regulators, both of the financial sector and the production sector. And um, so I think it's starting by saying this is a risk, but it's also a major opportunity. If, as in the case of Indonesia, we're talking about a product that represents 10% of our export revenues, then we need to be thinking about this in a way, and we can get a substantial advantage in this continually growing market if we uh, act early. Great, thank you so much. I think that's a great way to wrap up that involvement is needed from so many different perspectives, and hopefully you got some more insight into some of these perspectives on the call today. Uh, thank you so much for your time. We really hope that it was interesting and informative for you, and we're really looking forward to seeing you on our next webinar.